just watching Ike was a lesson in how to live life. And I know for some people, they're going to blow that off as, you know, sort of, come on, that's just West Coast flaky fluff. And But there's so much about just watching a dog and how it how it lives its life, how it shows up that we can learn from. And, and I guess I was in a situation where, you know, all of the tools and strategies that I had used throughout my life had in the moment they needed to, to matter most had blown up. And so it was kind of like, okay, so what else is there? And when I started to look at how I had lived my life up into to that point, um, I started to become more open to the hard questions that I needed to ask. And, uh, and that's where the self-awareness muscle started to get flexed, right? Hello, and welcome to the Conspiracy of Goodness podcast, where you'll hear conversations that generate one aha moment after another for you. There is enormous wave of goodness and progress well underway in the world that almost none of us know nearly enough about. It is so well hidden by the negative noise in our media landscape that I'm calling this wave of goodness a conspiracy of goodness. Yes, it is still an amazing world out there. And on this podcast, we'll introduce you to the people making it that way. Hello, I'm Dr. Linda Ulrich, host of this podcast and founder of the Mothership website, called the Goodness Exchange. The Goodness Exchange is this global place where you can have instant access to good news, articles, links, videos, interviews, to newsworthy insight and innovation that is just not rising to the top of our feeds. Not puppies in mailboxes. Think dogs that can sniff breast cancer in the earliest stages. There is a host of a world out there full of people who are innovators and full of insights, fresh ones, that we can all use to have more joy and less fear in our lives. And today we're talking to one of those innovators. We are gonna be talking with Jason Dorland. Jason is an Olympian, a father, a coach, entrepreneur, and a storyteller who has dedicated his life to pursuing excellence and helping others do the same. He's the author of a, a book called The Chariots and Horses, Life Lessons from an Olympic Rower, and then another book called Pulling Together, A Coach's Journey to Uncover the Mindset of True Potential. And now, most recently, his book is called Ike, The Dog Who Saved a Human. It's a book I <laughs> sitting here beside me, well, I might as well show it. It's a lovely book that I tell you, almost any animal lover can relate to. And it's a great example of something that my husband and I have muttered to each other for years, that we humans don't totally deserve dogs. <laughs> dogs are this can be this incredible teacher in our lives. And Jason has woven through this book about a special experience he had with a dog named Ike. So many life lessons that we can all take to our chase. <laughs> We're going to talk about chasing today and how we are all chasing something. And maybe maybe the way dogs operate in the world can teach us a better way forward. So now these days, Jason is sharing the life lessons and keynotes and workshops. And he has a company with his, with his wife, also an Olympian, Robin Marr, that helps people adopt mindsets that are unlimited. And so here we are going to enjoy a nice, great chat with, with Jason. And I got to tell you, just, just in the pre-chats that I've had with him, he is a joy. And I know you will take away some pearls from this, this interview that you can use every day. So welcome, Jason Dorland. Thanks, Linda. Appreciate that. Well, I got to tell you, I spent many a morning, that was my my, about three weeks ago, I spent many a morning in front of the fireplace. I live in Vermont, curled up with your book and highlighting and dog earing the pages. And we have so much to talk about from that. But, you know, let's start with this concept that, that I heard you say in a fabulous TED Talk that I came across. You said, the way dogs live can be an important metaphor. Dogs don't chase much except sticks. Can we start right there about this chasing? Yeah, well, I think... So much of our, especially in Western culture, is about the chase. And I think we, you know, whether it's conscious or unconscious, we are taught that as children, you know, chase your dreams. And, um, and I'm not so sure it's 
to the betterment of, of us, to our, of our life, of our joy, of our fulfillment, and even paradoxically, the things that we're chasing. I think the very notion of chasing interferes with our ability to achieve. And, you know, guilty as charged, I was that young boy. And- yeah, tell us, Jason has a very, very powerful, give us a little bit about your story so we can understand the source of lots of these insights. Yeah, right. Well, I was on the Canadian national team in rowing and was at the Olympics in 1988 in Seoul. And I was a member of the Canadian National Men's A. And although I wasn't a member of the 1984 crew, the, the 1984 crew had won an Olympic gold medal in Los Angeles. I was now a member of, of the, this crew f- four years later with some members from that crew. And the expectation from the media, from us, was to defend that Olympic gold medal. And, and we didn't, right? And so much of my time leading up to that race was about chasing. And my feeling going into that was that if I win this thing, right, if we win that Olympic gold medal, then everything will be right in the world because that's what I'd been taught, right? That when you chase your dreams and your dreams come true, like the Hollywood story, everything's, everything's great. And, but, you know, now all these years later, certainly realize that's, I think that's a disservice we do for our children. Yeah, there's a there's one point when you talk about that there that let's just start there with your insights. What that, that you talk about there is really no finish line in life. That the prize is never enough. Like part of your story is is what did happen to the people who won and and the fact that you lost but that turned out to be such an advantage in your life over the scope of time. Give us a little bit more about that window. Well, I think you know, goodness, I wouldn't have said it at the time, but if, if someone had come up to me after the final and tried to console me with, you know, don't worry, Jay, someday you're going to look back on this and it's, you're going to consider it the greatest gift of your life. You know, I'm, I likely would have not received that very well, right? And Because you guys but took six. And the, we came, and the we Canadian came DFL press. in that final. That's right. We were six. Yeah. And, the Canadian um, press went crazy bad on it, right? That they were not well. I mean, yeah. Again, another comment on Western culture. They they laid blame in their articles, the photographs, the, the headlines, all of it. And you know, sometimes I wonder if those guys ever consider if the athletes are actually going to read the paper, right? If they're going to see it, because it's yeah, it's one of those things, right? If you wouldn't say it in front of the person, then don't say it. And so, you know, I think when I got home after those Olympics and saw that front page and read that article. It was, you know, it was a moment, right? And yeah, but all these years later, I I do look back on that Olympic final and more specifically the outcome as being the greatest gift of my life because it challenged my narrative, right? That that life was about chasing, that your self-worth was built around the things you did and accomplished, and that your happiness and fulfillment would be, for the rest of your life, would be formed by the things you did and who you became. And at 25 years of age, I got a life lesson, right? I got a a real, you know, I got sent to the corner and the whole bit, right? It was sort of, wow, figure this out. And, and it was a ride, right? I'm not going to lie. It wasn't, it wasn't sort of an hour of pondering. It was it was over a decade of, of some serious bumps. And, but on the other side of that was the realization that I had bought into a lie and hook, line, and sinker, right? And, you know, as I say, I look back on the race and, and just I'm so grateful for it because the way I look at it now, if, if we had won that race, if we had done what we were supposed to, it would have reaffirmed for me that chasing was, was right and that my approach to competition was right, that my, this egoic approach to life was the right way because it worked. And yeah, it got it that far. I mean, it got you that far. Yeah. And, and I, and that's a really great point, Linda. And we often say that in our workshops or working with our clients that, you know, I would never lie that the ego can't get you places, right? Because it got me to an Olympic final. But what I would argue is that in, in the moment I needed my best self my ego got in the way, right? Because 
sitting on that start, sitting on the starting gate in that Olympic final. My ego believed that if I don't win this race, right, it, everything's been for naught, right? It's been a, it's been a waste of time, and so you better pull this off. And so, as we now, as we know now, that sort of pressure undermines performance, right? It releases hormones into your body that that prevent performance, don't that don't support it. And so, in a moment where I needed to be joyful and light and playful and open to what was going to happen, I was tight and afraid and and angry and just spinning and. You know, I look at it now and I just sort of think, wow, no wonder, <laughs> you know, losing in that final now makes sense to me as much as it was hard to accept in the moment. Yeah. You know, so, okay. So we're going to fast forward through some of this and we'll get back to the interstitial stuff. Sure. There, there became, so you recommitted, you doubled down after that loss to trying to make it to the next Olympics, yeah. but then had an awakening somewhere in there. And you're an artist and you went off and decided to go to art school. And along the way, you decided, I, in the book, I, I don't remember actually understanding what made you decide to take on the the job of taking in a seeing eye dog and raising it for a year, knowing you would have to get away. Because we're getting to the point of the book I know. Right. He's written this beautiful book about being a young man art student who took on the raising of this great, this great puppy and knowing that because it was, it was going to be a seeing eye dog, he would have to give it back to the those trainers after a year. And that's where this the story Ike starts. Tell me a little bit about that transition. Right. Why dog? I was away on a weekend with a friend and we ran into a couple who had a this beautiful golden retriever puppy and they had applied for the same program. Right? They were what what were called, and I don't know if they're still called, but they were called puppy walkers back then. So where you apply to the Canadian guide dogs, you get this puppy at eight weeks and it's your job to socialize the dog for a year. And then you hand it over and it goes off to, to sort of finish its hardcore training. And, but your job for that year is to take it to movies and restaurants and on buses and planes and just get it used to being with people and sitting under chairs and the whole bit. And, and. I'd always wanted to have a golden retriever and I figured this was a great way to do it for a year and have someone else pay for it, right? And I was in school or going to school and yeah, I just thought it was a great opportunity. I think in hindsight, I provided a distraction. It was just a few years after I had retired from my attempt to go to 92 in Barcelona. And I think unconsciously I made Ike another race, right? As I told the woman when I left, after she gave me Ike, I said, I'm going to produce the best guide dog you've ever seen. And I was hell bent on that, right? And <laughs> I mean, Ike had other plans, right? But yeah, that's the way I saw it. I, I was, th this dog was going to be something else. And but then you uh, kind of just check that box in. Yeah, yeah. that's right. I was, it was gold medal for a dog. Right. Dog. <laughs> there you go. It, without saying as much, it became a competition, right? The well, I, book is the book is so beautiful in that way, the way it unfolds, where you're unfolding and we unfolding with you. I like many, many times in the book I put it on my lap and sat contemplating my own situations. Yeah. Yeah. And I just think how typical of a twenty something year old man who has been living in a highly combative, high pressure, kill or be killed, win at all costs sort of world. That had been my life for more than a decade. And now I'm given this fuzzy ball of playful warmth with, you know, with beautiful puppy breath, right? And I've, and it just, you know, it couldn't have been two more opposing worlds. And so Ike became part of my rhythm every day. And Golden Retriever puppies being who they are, he slowly but steadily began to sort of crack that, that intent that I had and softened that edge of, of just producing something, right? You know, even my friends and family would say, you know, how on earth are you going to give this dog back? And I just was very matter of fact about it. Well, I'm just going to keep it all business, right? I'm not going to get attached to the dog. 
And what an asinine thing to say and, and think, right? That this golden retriever wasn't going to somehow get into my heart. And sure enough, you know, six months into the gig and he was starting to get in there. So it all came, kind of came crumbling down after that. I think it's that part of the story is relevant to how so many of us sort of buy into what the next step is. You know, I've got now three just graduated from college kids and they all that one of them followed a passion that's turned out fine. The other one didn't really, hasn't really seen what's the light. But boy, a lot of their friends wind up going and being consultants on Wall Street or going and doing very predictable things that are just the next step. And right. I think sometimes I get the feeling that they maybe all kind of, and many of us do, kind of hold our nose in a very production-like transactional way with the work we're doing in the world. Just exactly like the way you looked at taking on this puppy. We're saying, well, I'll be happy when, right. later later on, when I get this accomplished. And we aren't actually looking at the day-to-day lives we lead. Talk to us about right. that. Yeah, well, I think, you know, back to that young man, he lived above his shoulders, right? Everything that I did was an egoic and, and a strategy-based decision. Everything had to make sense. And when you spend 24 hours a day, seven days a week with a golden retriever, you realize that that's not their existence, that they live in, the, they are a, they are all about being, they are embodied in their presence of play. And so who they are is what they are being, right? And that wasn't me. And, you know, Ike invited that part of me to come forward, probably for the first time in my life in my growing adult life, was to let, was to start living below my shoulders, right? To start listening to what my heart had to say. And, you know, that was, yeah, that was a different, that was a whole different way of living. And when I started to discover that, things started to change. Lovely. Okay. So we're going to take a quick break that can connect folks to all kinds of fresh perspectives and great things going on in the world. And then we come back, we're going to talk more about exactly that. Let's take a break. Hi, Dr. Linda Ulrich here, founder of The Goodness Exchange. Hey, did you know that a recent Harvard study found that just 90 seconds of positive news each day will make you 18% more optimistic, 32% less anxious, and 12% more likely to feel gratitude? Yes, If you make a habit of learning about just one piece of remarkably good news each day, you will radiate joy and strength and ideas in all your circles. And the Goodness Exchange will give you that instant access you need to positive news, fresh insights, and uplifting perspectives. That will save you time and your sanity. Okay, that solves the problem in our personal lives. But what about our working environments? We need to feel alive in those places and feel supported. Well, enter the Goodness Exchange for business. For companies all over the world who want to create optimistic, values-driven work cultures, our content can give them a way to turn aspirational ideas like positivity into a concrete way of being in the workplace. In fact, employee retention and attraction may now depend on your culture's ability to nurture this tone of insight and innovation and possibility. So why should we care? I don't know which one of the following statistics is more important. In 2022, only 32% of people reported feeling engaged at work. And that's the second year in a row there for a decline in that report. And one study found that 70% of employees say they would leave their current organization for a different employer offering resources to reduce burnout. This is hard to hear, but your work culture can offer something new, peace of mind and a sense of flourishing, where employees' well-being isn't just a perk any longer. Addressing the root cause of employee burnout is critical to every company's bottom line, and the goodness exchange for business is the perfect way to do that. We can meaningfully elevate the results of your company's wellness efforts and benefits packages and give you an organization that has its foundations in a shared sense of positivity. 
If you'd like to chat about infusing your company's culture with a tone of celebration about what's right with the world, about goodness and innovation and progress, we'd love to chat. Contact our CEO, Liesl, at info at goodness-exchange.com. Thanks. Okay, we're back. So we are talking today with Jason Dorland, who is an Olympian, a father, a coach, an entrepreneur, and a storyteller. And he, is, he has re- recently bu- written a book called Ike that is a, a dog story and a people story. It's looking at our true potential through the eyes of a, a really great dog. And I got to say, um, Jason, we started this, our pre-chat, talking about the fact that in, in our own lives, we've had, we figured out there's two kinds of dogs. There's the dog dogs. The minute a rabbit goes by, they don't care about you. They're chasing the rabbit. And there's the people dogs. Those ones that look up at you, which is almost like a trembling fascination waiting for your next move and and to serve you. And it's dogs that are like that really feel like they're their reflection of our best selves. It, there's like an unconditional love happening there. And um, I can highly re- recommend the book, Ike. It's got a great, a great cover. And so let's spend the rest of this interview talking about some of the insights that you and your wife talk to people about that a lot come from your experience with Ike, a lot come from your experience as an Olympian, both of you. But it's really about reaching our true potential and not having a lot of, a lot of limiting beliefs. And I, I get what you're saying when you talk about your pre-life, your life before all this self-awareness. You had a lot of lim- limiting beliefs. Well, I think, you know, as I've said many times, some of the most insecure people you'd ever want to meet are elite athletes. And getting on the national team, heading, going to the Olympics, so much of, of what was going to define me would be the results from, from those Olympic games. And that in itself presents its, you know, creates this limiting belief that I'm unworthy unless I come home with an Olympic gold medal. And I don't think you have to be an elite athlete to hold that, that sort of paradigm. I think so many of us link achievement with self-worth. So I'll be good enough once I've done this or achieved this or own this. And yeah, that's just not how things, I mean, I, I've got there now, but that's not how things work. No. And then you're in that really close territory, which I'm sure you speak to that. I'll be happy when. Right. Gosh, I think that's a limiting belief that most of us walk around with. Yeah. You know, guilty is charged. Uh, it was, that was my, I mean, that drove me to train. It was what motivated me to want to go to the Olympics, right? When I watched the Canadian men's eight win in Los Angeles in 1984 as a 19-year-old kid, 20-year-old kid. It was, if I can do that, just imagine, right? And because the way they were celebrated in the press and in the media, I just, I wanted that. And so off we went, right? Four years of of chasing. And then it didn't work out. And that's a whole other, <laughs> that's a whole other situation but you know up until that race it was all about that finish line you know no no pun intended right it was once i have this then i'll be good to go and the prize is never what was promised right the prize never brings what we think it will right right i mean you ask you ask an entrepreneur who ha- who's a seasoned entrepreneur who's lived They'll tell you that getting to the top of that mountain and sort of achieving what you've always held out as the thing you need to achieve, it's never it. I remember hearing a story, I think it was Ted Turner, who had this wonderful story of, he shared with a younger entrepreneur who was just beginning his sort of, you know, his chase, if you will. And he kept, and he said to the guy, he said, the bag is empty, but you're going to have to find that out yourself right? The bag that's at the top of the mountain that you're chasing, that you're climbing to find right now, you're going to get to the top of that mountain. You're going to see the bag. You're going to open it up and it's empty. But I can't tell you that you need to find that out yourself. And it's so true, right? We always say, no, it'll be different for me, right? If I, once I have this, it, I'll be set, but I have yet to meet that person. 
So, you know, that is one of the beauties of dogs. And we were talking about people, dogs and dog dogs. You know, the people, dogs in my life taught, have always taught me how to be my better self. They're always looking at me with so much hope and so much vulnerability and this being, and I think my, my husband and my kids and I, we've always lived with animals and dogs. It makes us feel like we're in the service of something besides ourselves. Talk to us about this notion of being in service to others as it relates to, okay, if we're not going to chase the prize at the top right. of the mountain, you know, right. if you've got us convinced that there, there is no prize there, what do we do day to day? Well, uh, it's interesting now. I, I went to a school as a young boy where the Latin, as you know, they're, they always are Latin, right? But the expression was terra dum prosum, and it means to, to be consumed in service. And I just think when our life is about service, we, we, there's a different vibe, right? It's like working at a soup kitchen, right? When you volunteer to do something for someone else, you come out of there vibrating at a higher level than when you went in. And it's because there's something so beautiful and meaningful about doing something for someone else when you don't, when there's no, when there's no physical exchange, right? You're not getting something for doing it. It's a vibrational exchange, right? You just feel better. And when I figured that out, when I understood that when I'm in the service of other people, not only do I raise my level of fulfillment and happiness and joy and all that sort of stuff, but I also put myself on a level where I can experience my highest level of performance, right? I be, I'm open more to a higher level of performance, to being my best self, right? Because I'm open to flow state, right? When we are in a state of joy, we access a flow state more easily. When we're in a state of fear or threat, which is what I was on the start line of that Olympic final, we shut that down. And unbeknownst to me at the time, but you know, I get it all now. But there was so much about my preparation for the Olympics that was counter to what I was trying to achieve. And I think that's a hard lesson for so many people when they realize, wow, for so many years, I've been getting in my, in my own way. And here I've been blaming others and blaming my parents or my education or my situation or no, <laughs> no, you, right? Have a look at you. Tell me, you know, now we're right on top of this topic of self-awareness. Right. Where do we go with self-awareness? It's so easy to see the flaws in others. And then just start looking for evidence to back up what we see as the flaws in others. Totally. And never turn the mirror on ourselves. I, there's a great interview that we just did yesterday that will probably be up by then, by the time this one comes out, with a Jonathan Domsky, where we talk about self-awareness and how important that is to kind of turn the mirror on yourself and how freeing it is. It, it sounds hard. What do you talk to people about, about self-awareness? Right. And, you know, back to Ike, I just think I was so fortunate in hindsight because I had this beautiful coach that I was living with all the time because he was embodying who and what I wanted to be, right? He was confident. He had self-respect. He loved his life. He loved others. You know, I wasn't much of that, right? Certainly the confidence piece. And so, just watching Ike was a lesson in how to live life. And I know for some people, they're going to blow that off as, you know, sort of, come on, that's just West Coast flaky fluff. And, but there's so much about just watching a dog and how it lives its life, how it shows up that we can learn from. And I guess I was in a situation where you know, all of the tools and strategies that I had used throughout my life had in the moment they needed to matter most had blown up. And so it was kind of like, okay, so what else is there? And when I started to look at how I had lived my life up into to that point, I started to become more open to the hard questions that I needed to ask. And that's where the self-awareness muscle started to get flexed, right? And I've noticed the hard questions that I need to ask myself often come from the critique I have of others or the I critique I have of situations. Yeah. 
And now because I, not because I'm particularly good at self-awareness, but because of all the insightful people I've interviewed on this podcast, so much of it comes back, you know, fresh ideas that are just waiting there for us to take up a new path and find all kinds of new landscapes to journey in. It starts with self-awareness. It just starts sure. with asking questions about yourself and whether you've got the right map, mental maps, and whether you've got the right story about yourself and others. So there's a part in the book I want you to comment on because it relates to this. You were talking about a day that by this time in the book, I'm not going to give you away. It's a spoiler alert. I was just about to give a spoiler alert. Not. But you are, you have a Ike that, and he meets two other dogs. And they are a little out of control. And you say, Ike didn't try to match the bravado of those two dogs. Instead, he tried to diffuse the situation by being friendly and playful. But when those dogs crossed the line, he stood up for himself. And what it took to stand up for himself didn't come from his head or some thought or preparation of what being tough was. It came from deep inside him, from an inner knowing of what he was capable of. The strength and courage it took to defend himself came from his heart, not some tough guy showmanship. Jason paused and looked around at the other boys. So talk to us about what we, the lesson we're to take from this beautiful, loving, playful dog you know, find or being in a situation where right, had to, had... right, and I think that's where it sort of undoes the fluff comment, right? Is that this isn't just some unrealistic way of being, right? With Ike, with dogs, Ike in particular, in this case, his first choice in meeting a tough situation was to assume the best for the other people, right? The other dogs, and was to try to play and diffuse. But when that wasn't the intent of them, then there was a moment where he realized, okay, that's where, not where this is going, so I'm going to stand up for myself, and I have a line. And, but again, living below the shoulders, what, what was required in that moment of standing up for himself came from, his, from who he was, right? Not some egoic I idea of who he should be right? Some tough bravado, machismo kind of way. It was just his nature to be playful. But when it mattered, he was willing to stand up, right? And to do what was required. And I just think, you know, I was the opposite, right? I, I would come in to a situation with bravado and tough guy and thinking I need to appear as if I'm strong and able to take care of myself. <clears throat> when it should have been the other way, where I was coming in more heart-centered, right? More, more concerned about who I was as a person, not how I was showing up on the surface. You know, that, that brings us to this. You have a great little part in there where you say, if you find yourself averting your best effort for fear of not being your best, there's something about dogs that they're always so in the present. They're not thinking about what happened Two hours ago, how, how you dissed them or ignored them or right. uh, bringing a lot of baggage to the new situations. Right. I think we all have the same opportunity if we have a little self-awareness. You know, the next time I'm, I'm with that person who made me feel uncomfortable last time, like, start over. I love your point about starting off with the idea of best intention. Right. And I just think, you know, to your point earlier where you where we go looking for things that are going to prove our opinion right. So in the face of someone who might have said something, we're going we're gonna to try and continue to spin that story. And we're going to look for things that, that where we can go, see, yep, I was right. And whereas a dog, they don't write those stories. <laughs> that they are done. It's whatever happened, happened. They're moving on. And I think if we could adapt, if we could adapt, I don't know, I wouldn't call it a strategy, but that default, that way of being, I think life would be a lot easier, right? Because we wouldn't get caught up in the stories that we create, right? We would be more more willing to move on and just kind of let it go. Oh, that is so true, but it's so hard to do, isn't it? I just think, yeah. you know, uh, it is so hard, right? But 
but there's a part of it that's easy. But, you know, I, I know for myself, that insecurity, that wanting to find fault in others and spin that story was, oh man, I, I just think of the hours, days, years wasted living in that world and just how life might have been so different. If, if I just, you know, I, I've often said one of the beautiful things about turning 50 is you stop caring so much, right? You just, you don't get caught up in the stuff and the drama that you did as a younger, younger person. And yeah, so I just think there's far too much drama in our younger years. So true. And that's a choice. I mean, it's just a choice. Yeah. A lot of people really forget the the amount of choice that they have in life to engage this crazy thing or that crazy thing or and certainly from my world where we're always talking about how we could be reacting to the news it's a choice yeah <laughs> and we just we've got to we got to get back to feeling empowered in this world talk to us about how love and conditional relationships mess with us. And then dogs, you know, dogs have this unbelievable, unconditional love for us. Right. They have to teach us about love and conditional relationships. Sure. You know, I think one of the, I think one of the beautiful things that dogs bring into our life isn't just the sense that we feel loved. Like it's awesome to come home and to be greeted the way we are by our dogs, right? That's a, yeah. to be loved on that level unconditionally, as, as we love to say, is a beautiful thing. But I think the other part that we love about our dogs is the love that it elicits from us. It is, we feel free to love our dogs on a level that we don't feel free necessarily to love the people in our lives because we have conditions on that love. With dogs, there are no conditions. We can love freely, and that feels loving feels good. And so I think one of the reasons why people have dogs in their lives is because, is, isn't just because that they feel loved by their dog, is that they get to feel the experience of loving on a level we don't always with the other people in our lives. And I don't think that's a fault of ours. I don't think, you know, I've had this conversation with Robin for it. Like, as much as I love my wife and daughter, my, my family, I don't know that I can consciously or unconsciously love them the way I love our dogs. It's just different, right? It's just different. It's different. And it is, there, there is no moment in my affection or love for Oakley and Bella, our two present dogs, where I question or hold back or, you know, sort of control the floodgate. There's never that moment. It just comes pouring out of me. But in my interactions with people during the day, my foot is on the gas and the brake at the same time. I'm constantly aware of how much I can express my love for fear of how it's either going to be received or reciprocated, right? And, and that's where we, as humans... That's where we create our own shortcomings because we use love to control one another. Yeah, and it's just crappy. Whereas dogs, they don't. It, there's no conditions. There's no strings attached in, in the love that we either give or receive from a dog. And there's some strength that comes from that. Don't you think, gosh, when I'm with our current dogger, the one that came before it, we've been very lucky to have 20 years of one of those dogs, those right. dogs. Right. And we had one in between that we didn't realize had a lot of potential, but we were comparing it. <laughs> oh, that's another. Talk about the comparison. Oh, that's well, a big one. It's why I've never got another golden retriever, right? Because because I didn't want to ever have to compare it to Ike. And I mean, now everything's all our last dogs have been rescues. And so, and, you know, I just didn't know about this thing that was rescues back then, but thought. Well, I tell you, there's a great quote in the book from your wife about comparison, because she's a Olympic athlete right. as well. She says, we could all be running with our, with our competitors, not against them. Right. 
if we all run farther and faster, we all run farther and faster. I mean, isn't this the way that we can look at our relationships with our coworkers and for sure? Our, our yeah, and I, I again a little bit. Right. And I think just back to Western culture, right? We exist in a combative paradigm, right? We learn that from children from childhood and beyond. And it is the interesting piece in that the Latin back to Latin again, the Latin root word of competitor is competir, which actually means to strive together, right? So in Western culture, we've bastardized that term. We've turned it into against. I compete against someone, not with someone. And it was Robin who sort of brought that awareness into my world that she competed in a, utilizing a synergistic relationship, right? So she drew on the strengths of the other runners in the race to support her ability to run fast. Whereas when I competed, I wanted to diminish the ability of my competitors to race. And in doing so, it diminished my ability to race. And that is the part that we, that's the nuance that, that if we could understand that, our relationships with so many parts of our lives would change. When we see our competitors as someone to work with, as opposed to someone to work against, it, I mean, everything changes, right? And when I began coaching again, when I came back to coaching after losing in Seoul and retiring from rowing, and I started to adopt Robin's approach, not only did I realize that this was a much healthier way to coach, but it was one hell of a strategy because the crews that I was coaching became, they consistently won international and national championships. And so I thought, wow, there's something to this, right? It isn't just some flaky, feel good kind of way to, to see competition. It's actually a strategy for high performance. High performance all over the place. High performance with our teenagers, high performance with our coworkers, high performance in the organizations that we volunteer with on boards and so forth. If we looked at it like we were running with people instead of against them. And we were, I recently applied for a grant to, to learn a lot more about podcasting and elevate this podcast to an even better level. One of the questions pretty early on in the, in the questionnaire that you had to fill out was, who are your competitors and you know what do you need to do to out to something they didn't word it like this it was it was more nicely worded but it was kind of like what do you need to outrun them right what do you need from us and it, uh, again yeah, it was worded much nicer than that, but that was the gist right and i was like oh, i never see it like that if there are other people in the space of sharing good news with the world for god's sake we need more <laughs> we need more people doing right. that right and so I was going to answer, I knew what the answer they wanted was, but then I just started over and I just said, no, if I discover competitors, I'm going to, I'm going to try and work with them. I'm going to try and find out what we're doing in parallel and where our efforts intersect. Right. We got to lift a different narrative up about right. this world in the future. Yeah. And of course we didn't get the grant <laughs> and we really need it. Yeah. But I'm not unhappy that I that when I got to that one that seemed very important to them in the application, I just answered it from the heart. And we'll find another way. Yeah. Um, but that, I think not, that we go ahead. I was just gonna say, you know, it's not universal yet, right? We're we're there there's still it's taken on it is it's ubiquitous in our culture, right? This notion of the combative mindset, right? The idea of having to dominate your competition, having to crush them. That's an expression you'll hear yes. all the time coming out of sportscasters' mouths. Yeah. And I just think, is you know, what a shame. Like, first of all, what are we teaching our youth? But we're also creating an obstacle for them to get to that highest level of, of performance by creating a world where it's us against them. It is you against your competitor, right? I mean, as a young boy, I was taught to hate my competitor as a form of motivation and cool baby like that's just so off <laughs> that's just so broken on so many levels and yeah goodness you'll hear it all the time yeah on, in now, i see a world coming though all the time the people i interview on here I, I don't believe one single innovator i've ever interviewed had an enemy 
Yeah. They never do. They just, that's what they do. The great, the greats have an idea that's so good. They don't need an enemy to, sh- to be a contrast to show right. how good their idea is. It's just shining all by itself. So let's talk about one, one last thing as we start to wrap up here, because I think this is really important in our lives. You have something that you talk about, about called the athlete's transition. And I, in the, in my husband and my practice, we are involved in the lives of thousands and thousands of people. And when I read this section in your work about the athlete's transition, I really be able, we are all going through something like you went through with the day that you said, that's it. I'm not going to be Olympic roar anymore. Then what, right? It's the work transitions we make. It's the it's retiring. It's a physical transition. Like I lost the feeling in my left two fingers after I broke my arm so badly. So I couldn't be a dentist anymore. That was a gigantic transition. How about relationship transitions? You know, so many of us identify with our partner. And then when that goes away, who are we? What are we? So I, I want you to comment on this because you said when we do one thing really well, and it's all you've ever done, and you lose that thing, there's a gap. Talk to us about what happened. Right. And I think that's why athlete transition, especially, is so challenging. And not to diminish career transition, life transition, you know, the transition is tough, period. But I think why athlete transition is so challenging and why we see so much troubling news that comes out of out of the sports world around that with mental health and what have you is because that identity is formed at a, at an important time in their life, right? From teenage right. into young 20. And that's when we latch on to our identity. And so for me, my identity was a high performance athlete. I, w- I was an international rower. And not only that, but it got the attention of people. It was worthy. And so when I sort of handed in that membership, it was like, oh man, if I'm not that, then what I, what am I now? And so I went looking, I went chasing for something else that was going to, that was going to fill that gap, right? That was going to allow me to show up as impressive as an Olympic athlete. And when I realized that, that there was nothing out there that could fill that gap, it was a moment of, well, then who am I, right? If I'm not an Olympian, if I'm not going to win a gold medal, what am I going to do that's going to get the attention of people? And there just was never an answer. And so I had to come to the, the cold reality of, well, Jace, bud, like <laughs> you got a long life to live and it's time to figure this out, right? You, and that was when the, the conversations of you are not what you do, right? That's when that became real for me. And so I had to come to the place of realizing that where, and it's still ongoing, right? I think it's ongoing until the day we die. I had to realize that waking up in the morning and not having to do or be anything had to be enough, right? That had to be enough. If I couldn't love myself without doing or being something extraordinary, then I was never going to love myself once I had achieved something extraordinary. If that emotion, if that self-love wasn't there on day one, it wasn't going to be there on the day of of this amazing accomplishment. It's just not how, how life plays. I have to push back on that some. I think what you're describing is exactly what I've seen in people's lives when the bank president retires and he had all this notoriety and was always in demand for boards and this and that. And then then there's not that. Or the women who did amazing jobs as as stay-at-home moms and then their kids are all grown up and they say, oh, my reason Etra is gone. Sure. I think this version of reality plays out in all our lives when we are committed to something for a long time that we sink our identity chops into. And so you and I were laughing about a show that you thought was interesting in this light. Is shrinking something that is insightful? Is it? You've had some fun with that show. It's I've had, we've had some fun with that show also because we've been watching it with our 18-year-old daughter. And so there's an 18-year-old girl in the show and 
So there are some incredibly awkward and uncomfortable moments, mainly for her to be sitting beside her parents and watching this life unfold of this young teen. So I think that's where a lot of the, the laughters come from. But, well, we'll uh, share that with people. I'm going to, my husband and I are going to sink into that tomorrow. Yeah, I just think it's situational comedy, right? And I think what makes it funny is the truth. That's what makes humor funny, is that it's true. And so watching this show, you see the absurdity of our culture, of our society. And when you're able to laugh at it, you realize, wow, there's some crazy mix, mixed up stuff that we believe in our world. And uh, yeah, and, and that's and that we believe in our world. Like I, I look at these bank presidents that are retiring or these these stay at home moms that that ha as, you know, balls of human magnificent potential because sure. they've got their the time on their hands to go volunteer for organizations that we really need their lived experience to navigate better. Right. right. I just look at it like so much potential once you move. Sure. From one thing to another. I moved from being a, a dentist to, to doing this, which arguably right. is a lot more impactful for a lot more people. Luckily, I had it to move to because this right. broken arm certainly came out of nowhere. Right. But I, what can you give people as in the way of, of encouragement as we wrap up here with, with how that transition looks when it's well done? Yeah. And I, I think, you know, to your point, though, you can't. I don't think we can convince someone of their self-worth. Ah. Right? That's a moment of self-discovery. That's a moment. That's, that penny has to drop for them, right? So, Are we I, back I, to service? Sorry? Are we then back to oh, service? I think always. I think that's always our, you know, even in the research around motivation, service comes up as the number one motivator, right? When it is about contributing to the greater good we are able to show up at our best self more easily and for a longer period of time. And, yeah, because um, people I've noticed that have been really lovely in those transitions are people that then said, okay, now I do have the time insert to be in service of others. And they go on to amazing, amazing things. You bet. And I think when we can make you know most of our day about service, we put our head down on the pillow at night, having had a good day because we have been contributing to something bigger than us. And we are hardwired to live that life. But I think the narrative that so many, of us grow, so many of us grow up with, and we're back to the chase, is that life is about us. It's about me getting stuff, achieving stuff, driving, grinding, right? And again, it's a, I just think it's a big freaking lie. And when we turn that on its head, and we can, sure, we can push and achieve and work hard and what have you, but when it's in the service of something bigger than us, the fuel that, that drives that kind of life is bigger and it's cleaner burning and it's more sustainable. And I just think where it takes you is to a more happier, fulfilled life. I mean, I've learned it the hard way, right? As a young boy, everything was about me. An elite athlete, I don't think there's a more selfish existence. When you step out of that place and you realize, wow, I was really wrapped up in myself for a long part of my life. And you start caring and serving others, caring about and serving others. <laughs> you know, it's, yeah, there's, it's a moment, right? Lovely. So as we wrap up here, Jason Dorlin, how can people best connect with you and continue on this journey? Because I, I think that you're capable of taking people on a journey they could never go on without you. Where can people connect with you? Yeah, well, Robin and I, um, we coach together, right? So we work with executives, we work with high performance, anybody, you know, people who are trying to raise their game in life, in work, in what have you. And so yourmindset.ca is our website. So you can, you can reach out to us through that. And then if they're interested in reading about Ike, and then I love read, or no, just lovereadingike.com is, is the website. And you can either purchase it on my Shopify site. Or you can go to Amazon, and if you have Prime, I'm no offense taken. Shipping rates are shipping rates, right? And if you've got free shipping, then go for it. But yeah, so those would be the way. But mainly, yourmindset.ca would be the would be the way to find us. Lovely. That is such a great connection for people. I I can't thank you enough. You're certainly part of this wave of goodness and progress that I'm talking about. These fresh perspectives, 
that really point to what we've got to move away from. And there, there's some beautiful thing to move to. So thank you for reminding us of that. I, I hope that, I hope that everyone that is joining us today will check out the good, the goodness exchange and perhaps some of the other podcasts here. We're interviewing people like Jason all the time. You can put a spring in your step again. Just keep remembering that what we see in the media is only a slice of reality. And it's usually the negative slice. And there are countless people like Jason who are making the future better for all of us. So I hope the connections to goodness and progress that we shared with you today will help you through your week and you'll start finding all the joy and wonder that Jason and I have been talking about today. Thanks.